All right, let's get started. Thanks everyone for being here today. This is our last um, event in this series, and uh, I see people here who have been here the whole the whole series, and that's great. Thank you so much. And a special thanks to Michelle for uh, baking for us uh, this semester again. <laughs> Even, even, even though she's uh, retired from, from teaching, she's still on, on campus for research and to provide us with these. And those are amazing cookies, by the way, uh, with the, the wine cookie cutter. It's amazing. So uh, our guest today is uh, Suzanne Hunt, co-owner of the Hunt Country Vineyards, which is near Branchport, right? Um, just a little bit of background. Suzanne has a BS in Environmental Resources Management from Penn State University, a Master's in International Affairs from American University, and a Master's in Natural Resources and Sustainable Development from um, the UN's University for Peace in Costa Rica. Uh, she held a variety of positions related to sustainability and environmental policy over the years. And in addition to her work at Hunt Country, uh, Suzanne is VP of um, for Public Policy at Generate Upcycle, which manages sustainable infrastructure, various types. You should go on their website. There's a lot there. Um, so infrastructure projects in North America and Europe. So with that, I'll pass on the microphone to you. I made a knot in it. Like I had it for two minutes and I made a knot. There you go. Am I detecting an accent? Yes. Where's that from? <laughs> Can you guys hear me okay? All right, so I apologize for my voice. I had a sinus infection a couple of weeks ago, and I still haven't got my voice back, but I shouldn't be contagious. Um, <clears throat> so thanks for having me, everybody. Um, as Fred was saying, I've done all kinds of different things over the, the last few decades, so I'm happy to talk in depth about anything. Um, so I, what I'll do is I'll try to take you through um, the slides, just to give you an idea, some of the stuff that we're working on at the winery and thinking about in the wine industry and some of the technologies that we've deployed at our, at our business and our farm. And then um, I'll just open it up and we can have a free flowing conversation um, since I'm sure you know, we could go in any direction. Um, and then if you have questions during the presentation, by all means, feel free to, to interrupt. Um, they don't have to be super formal. So, um, we are a seventh generation family farm. Um, I just threw this in, to, to, this was taken about 100 years ago. It looks like a photographer came to the farm and they tried to get every single thing they owned into the picture. Um, but you can see that there's um, vineyards in the background. Uh, a lot of people don't know that the epicenter of the American wine industry in the 1800s was at Cuca Lake. Um, all the Europeans immigrated to this continent on the East Coast and brought their winemaking traditions with them. And um, some of my ancestors were credited with getting the commercial grape growing industry started in the 1830s. And it really started booming in the 1850s when they started sending uh, train loads of grapes down to New York City and people went mad after the grapes. Um, and then prohibition killed it off in 1920 um, and it wasn't ended until 1933. So um, the wine industry that is booming in the Finger Lakes now is really just kind of a, a rebirth actually. Um, so my parents took over the farm from the previous generation in the 70s. Um, I love this picture. Um, my dad was probably making apple cider in this picture, but, um, but, uh, but they, he did start doing home winemaking in the 70s. Um, the grape market crashed in the 70s. Some of you guys might remember um, that there was a huge crash. Hundreds of growers went out of business. There was no one to sell the grapes to. Um, so my parents had just planted, you know, just taken out loans to buy the farm, just taken out loans to plant the vineyards. It's five years before your grapes are, are mature and you get, a, you get your, first, your first crop. So you've invested in labor and wires and posts and vines, and you've cared for those vines for five years. So farming takes, you know, these really long time frames and, and decades of planning. Um, and then the market crashed. So they, they made lemon, lemonade out of lemons. They made wine out of the grapes they couldn't sell and um, started winning awards. I don't know if you guys, anyone remembers the first Governor Cuomo, um, but they, they started winning awards and people really liked the wine, so they thought they'd stick with it. It's been, I think, 42 years now. Um, this is an overview of the farm today. Um, one of the interesting things about fine wine grapes is, is an agricultural crop is that they are one of the most 
climate sensitive crops in the world. Um, <clears throat> weather is an integral part of what develops the flavors uh, in wines. And so the wine industry as opposed to many other industries that have tried to pretend that climate change isn't happening um, for decades. The wine industry has been talking about this since I was born. I remember being a little kid 30 years ago um, and well, plus uh, years ago and reading the enology and viticulture magazines that were on the coffee table in the house and they were talking about how the climate cha changing was gonna shift the wine regions of the world. <clears throat> so it's been nice to grow up with an industry that's been very um, realistic about climate change. And, um, and you know, many people in it are, are thinking about what to do. And, you know, a, a friend of mine said, the grapes don't lie, which I thought was so perfect because you, we can literally taste the changes. Like, there's no denying it. Um, <clears throat> has anyone heard the word terroir? All right. So I have a new audience, almost new audience. Um, so it derives from the French word for land. Um, terroir is a word we use in the wine industry. Um, it, basically, it's your, it, it refers to how you're capturing the unique essence of your place in the wine. Um, you know, some people would make it a very, very broad uh, definition to include the complete natural environment that the wine's produced. You know, everything from the topography, the way the air flows through your vineyards to the, your choices in the, in the cellar. Um, my favorite definition, having read many of them that I sort of compiled is, terroir is the expression of the land and the climate embodied in the flavor of your wine. And this is why, this is why you can go to our winery and try our Riesling and go to a winery a few miles away and it's gonna taste different because it's different slopes, different soil types, um, it might even be, you know, different rocks, you know, rock properties, and we're mostly shale in the Finger Lakes, but there's quite a bit of variation, um, being that it's glacially deposited soils. Um, <clears throat> so terroir to me is a super beautiful kind of term because, you know, one of the things about humans is that we are wired for storytelling. We have some artists in the room and, you know, I can make scientific arguments all day long, technical arguments, moral arguments, but really, you know, people are, um, people are very much captured and motivated by their emotions. And so one way to actually communicate these, these issues that are really scary and really difficult um, is to tell them as part of a story. And part of the story of, of our business and of the wine industry is that you can't make beautiful wines. We can't like make super healthy, nutrient rich foods and beverages if we don't take care of our place, if we aren't good stewards of our, our terroir. Um, so with climate being such um, an integral part of terroir and, and of food and wine, um, the, the climate is changing. I don't know if I can get this. Oh, look at that. It might work. Yes. I don't know if you guys have seen this. This is from NASA. It's a visualization of how the average global temperature has been changing since the late 1800s. Um, I think, you know, there's all this conversation, especially this week while the Conference of the Parties is happening, about how you know, we have to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. And that sounds like nothing to most people. It doesn't sound important, but that's the global average temperature. But there isn't, as you could see in the video, like it, the, the warming doesn't happen equally everywhere. It's happening much more intensely and much more rapidly in the Northern um, part of the, the planet, a lot more in, in Europe, um, a lot faster in Europe, parts of Africa. Um, and this is just averages, right? We don't live through averages. We live through the, the weather every day, day to day. And we are getting, I'm sure you've noticed, more and more extreme weather events, um, more drought, more, um, more storms. So the result is that the wine maps of the world, the wine industries are starting to shift. Um, this is even, this is a, a, from an article um, from, I don't know, seven years or five, seven years ago or something. And so this has already shifted again. Um, but what this is showing is that some of the most favorite, famous wine regions of the world, places like Napa, um, places in Southern Europe, Italy, um, that have been known literally in some of them for a thousand years or more, thousands of years as wine producing regions, are gonna start to be too hot for, for making fine wine. Um, so there's quite a bit of adaptation already happening in the industry to deal with this. Um, you know, we're seeing, um, and, and there's so much literature about this. There's so much that's been written in the academic literature, in the wine industry literature. Um, there's um, 
incredible uh, articles written by families in Germany that have been making wine for hundreds of years in the same areas that have kept detailed records of harvest dates, sugar levels, alcohol levels. And so you can see the shifts over the centuries. Um, it's things like um, warm nights in France leading to lower acid levels in the grapes. And if you've ever had a wine that tastes, just tastes watery or flat, probably doesn't have enough acid in it. So your experience of a, an, a gorgeous white wine from the Finger Lakes is gonna be a combination of, of the, the fruit flavors in it, the other flavors in the wine, the acid. Um, if it's a red wine, it's gonna have tannins and what we call structural elements. All of those things are impacted by shifts in the climate. <clears throat> um, there's also places like New Zealand. I used to work with Air New Zealand on sustainability issues for them. And so I got to go to New Zealand twice a year. And yeah, it's my favorite gig of all time. Um, and I visited some of the, um, you know, they're being an island nation, their, their wine regions, some of them are right near the ocean. And so sea level rise is even an issue for the wine industry in some parts of the world. <laughs> Um, in this area, uh, we've been seeing, um, on average, again, you know, so polar, polar vortex aside, on average for the last half century, we've been getting gradually warmer winters. Um, we've been having more erratic weather, extended warm spells in the winter, which can de-harden grapevines. So if you think of all of our tr deciduous trees that drop their leaves, our grapevines drop their leaves, um, go to sleep for the winter, they harden off, you know, they stop producing the sap. Um, when we have these weird 60, 65 degree days in the middle of February, if those periods extend too long, the grapevines think it's spring and wake up and the sap starts flowing. And then if the temperature plummets again, they can literally snap and crack as it freezes. Um, so there's all kinds of crazy stuff. You guys, did anyone hear about the, the deep freeze in the Finger Lakes this year that killed off a lot of the grape buds? Yeah, it was one of the most depressing days of my life. The next day going out and seeing the buds just dead. Um, I'll talk more about that because not all of them died and I'll tell you why. Um, <clears throat> we also had a lot more droughts. I was home. I moved back home. So I lived in Washington for a long time. I lived overseas, moved back home, um, uh, nine years ago. And, um, we had a drought in 2016 where it didn't rain for seven weeks for all of July and three weeks of August, not a single drop of rain on our farm. It looked like California. The lawns went yellow. It was incredible. So um, in, in general, this part of the world is expected to, to, to warm a little slower than other parts of the world. We're expected to have more, more water. But again, it's these averages, right? And then the ex extreme swings. That makes it, you know, agriculture is a hard thing to do. Farming has always been difficult and climate change is just making it much harder, much more expensive and much riskier. Um, so this is uh, just a chart to show you um, from Cornell. They've been uh, studying the same block of grapes for 50 years, and they've tracked how um, bud break has moved up on average over the last half century by 10 days. Um, bloom is um, eight days earlier on average, which doesn't sound huge maybe, but if you think that's the average, and you have bud break coming two or three weeks early some seasons, and then you have a deep freeze like we did in May, there go your buds. And as one of the researchers at Cornell uh, likes to say, the, the buds only need to die once to be dead for the year. There goes your harvest for the whole year, your crop for the year. Um, another impact on the wine industry, has anyone ever had ice wine? Yay. So my dad started making ice wine in the 80s. Um, so we're the longest continuous producer of a genuine ice wine in, in, in America. And um, it's getting harder and harder to get an ice wine. Um, it's a process where you leave the grapes on the vine until they look like this, until they're frozen solid. And we have to wait till it's below 15 degrees Fahrenheit to pick them because you want all of the water that's in the grapes to be frozen solid. And then you want like just the thick syrup, so, like sugary syrup um, to be pressed out of them. And it's sort of, I think of it as like the opposite of maple syrup. So maple syrup, you take the sap and you boil the water out. In ice wine, you take cold and you freeze the water out. Um, so yeah, so Germany has had a few seasons where they've gotten essentially no ice wine because it's warming quite rapidly in Europe. So if there's anything that you guys remember from my talk today, it is that um, 
we can help establish resilience through diversity. This, this works in companies with human beings. You see much more high performing companies when you have much more diverse workforce. It also works in the natural world. You don't ever see like a monoculture natural forest, right? You always see mixed species. You always see a diversity of species in every natural ecosystem because that makes it resilient, right? This is the, the web of life, not the line of, <laughs> not the string of life, right? So um, the same thing with our agriculture. You know, we went from highly diversified agriculture back in the old days. Um, you know, our farm had all kinds of different vegetables and crops and fruits and, and, and livestock. And so did all the other farms in America. And then we went to this far extreme of like hyper, high, high, hyper specialization and concentration, which during the pandemic we all saw brings its own risks and problems and bottlenecks. So, um, so we really need to bring some diversity back into our food system. Um, and um, what that means in the wine industry is like maybe, maybe not having everyone grow the same like three grapes. Maybe we, we can all grow Riesling, it's beautiful. We love our Riesling, Cab Franc. I'm never letting go of Cab Franc. But we also need to grow a bunch more climate resilient, much more rugged hybrid varieties that like in May, didn't, we still got a crop even though there was a deep freeze and our Riesling and our Cab were just dead. We had no crop this year. Um, they're also the, these rugged hybrids and Cornell University has been breeding them for decades and decades and decades. And they're literally bred um, to have the winemaking characteristics of the European varieties and the ruggedness and, and, and resistance to mildew and resistance to pests and other things and temperature, uh, ability to withstand temperature extremes that the rugged North American native and wild grapes had. Um, so I encourage you guys, this is your homework, go out and try wines that, uh, with grape varieties you've never heard of. Don't just pick a Chardonnay or a Riesling because you know how to say it. Go be adventuresome. I know it's funny, but like literally people will not know how to pronounce something on a menu and they don't want to be embarrassed in front of their date, so they don't order it. Um, so go out and try, come to our place and try all these weird different varieties. Um, we're only an hour away, other homework. Um, sure, um, well, so you know Cayuga Lake, uh, one of the varieties that Cornell uh, bred that uh, they named after Cayuga Lake called Cayuga. It's a beautiful, beautiful white. Um, we use it to make a bubbly, we use it to make a semi-sweet white, and we've actually got an organ our organic Cayuga. I just got to try a barrel sample that um, is gonna, I think we'll probably finish, I think it'll probably be fairly dry, um, but it's just, <clears throat> just a lovely grape. Um, some of the old hybrids that were bred in France in the 1800s are uh, Vignoles, Save all. Um, there's also we've got Coro Noir, Baco Noir, um, Chamberson is a really cool red hybrid. Um, yeah, there's there's so many. I should have brought it. I have a, a book that Cornell published 110 years ago called The Grapes of New York. It's this thick. You can find them every now and then in an antique bookshop for you know six hundred dollars. And we just we of course we just had it in the house, you know. <laughs> um, and it has hundreds and hundreds of grape varieties because they used to get excited about the diversity, you know, 100 years ago. And now it's like, no, just give me, give me a Chardonnay. So, um, so yeah, so bringing the excitement about a greater diversity is, is, is one of uh, the things that actually makes, our, makes things more interesting. Like, who doesn't want to have a more diverse diet? Um, so she asked about wildfire. So, so far we haven't been directly impacted by wildfires. The um, California wineries with the fires, they've had a lot of damage. They, it's called smoke taint. So even if there, there wasn't a fire directly on their property, um, the smoke um, impregnates the skins of the grapes if they're ripe and um, ruins, the, ruins the grapes. Uh, so smoke taint has been a huge problem out west. Um, the smoke that came through the spring didn't impact our grapes, um, but you know, fire on these in, in these drought seasons is a real concern. Um, my dad, my brother, and my husband are all volunteer firemen, and they do a good job of keeping our fire services very high quality and, and ready to go. So, um, that's our strategy. Uh, but um, but yeah, no, fire is a huge concern, and and it's um, it's a difficult conversation to think about what do we do with our forests and how do we manage them with all the different beetle kill and 
that's a that's a, a big topic. So one of the things we've done, and how am I doing on time? Am I burning up all my time? Okay. Um, so one of the things we did to get people excited about some of these rugged, climate resilient uh, hybrid grapes is we launched uh, a new brand called Uncharted Terroir because climate change is taking us into uncharted territory in the wine industry. Um, so we've sold out of a couple, but we still have a couple and um, you can come try those. Um, this is more just about the storytelling. Um, one of the ways we talk about this is that you can't make good wine without clean air, healthy soil, and a stable climate system. All right, so I'll just run through some of the nuts and bolts things we've done. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of adaptation happening in the wine industry. You know, there are even places that are putting shade cloth over, over vineyards and nurseries. Um, using different yeasts that extract less alcohol because there's just so much sugar and so much over ripening in some regions that they're trying to like bring down the, 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 the alcohol levels. Um, but job number one is to, to reduce, is reduce the harm. So we're doing our part. I know these are huge global overwhelming issues, but if everybody just did their part, we'd be in, in good shape. So <clears throat> we as a little family business, no outside investors, um, so if we can do it, lots and lots of other businesses can do it as well. Um, we've essentially eliminated our fossil fuels for heating, cooling, and power. Uh, we installed um, uh, lots and lots of LEDs, hundreds of LEDs um, uh, years ago. Uh, lighting technology has advanced super fast. LEDs are cheap, and you can get them in every single style possible. Um, and it saves you labor. You don't have to get huge ladders and change light fixtures every two years. Now, the last 10, 15 years. Um, so that's a big consideration for something like a campus. Um, these old um, super inefficient lamps, um, we took them down, the huge energy hogs. Uh, I had looked at LEDs like, I don't know, 12 years ago or 15 years ago, and they were going to be $1,000 a piece to replace those lights. And then when we replaced them like six or seven years ago, they were 80 bucks each. So if you've checked something and it looks too expensive, check again a couple years later, because the prices of a lot of these technologies are dropping really fast. Um, so we super insulate all the buildings. And then um, uh, in 2012, we installed a, a large geothermal heating and cooling system. So we have 6,000 feet of piping in a closed loop below, below the ground. Um, the cool thing about geothermal is you bring the drilling rig in, you put the pipes in the ground, and then the rig goes away and it's like, it doesn't take up any space. There's no eyesore, there's nothing. So it's just this beautiful, silent, quiet, heating and cooling year round. Um, and so the rocks below us here in this part of the world are about 55 degrees year round, once you're below about seven feet. And so the heat pumps just take the, the heat from the earth and exchange it, um, and the heat exchangers exchange it with the air in the buildings and warm it up. And then it reverses in the summertime to keep it cool. Um, 2015, we installed 348 solar panels. We worked with a local co-op and we even had Mennonite electricians um, install those. Uh, in 2019, I worked with Tesla. Um, EV chargers are really expensive <laughs> to install, um, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So we, I worked with Tesla and they helped us um, install chargers and I got them to even uh, supply a, a, a non-Tesla charger so all of our customers could charge up. And there's adapters too, actually. Like it's kind of a little known fact, you can just get an adapter. If, and I think now that they're gonna finally get all the car companies to use the same plug. So it'll get better in the future. And that's the Tesla charger. We built stone walls around them. If you guys ever wanna come learn how to build stone walls, we do stone wall workshops every year. It's really fun. Um, I thought I'd throw a little like memory lane history in. Um, one of these guys is my great, 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 great grandpa. He's like the guy with the handsome guy with the beard there um, in the middle. Um, in 1897, he and a bunch of the other families got together in the area. And I have a whole bunch of receipts from his investments and stuff in the attic. Um, they built the first power plant in the area because rural electrification didn't come for a few more decades. They built it in Cuca Park, where Cuca College is. And it used to be called Electric Park. And then they used it to power the first little electric railway in the region that went from Penyan to Cuca Park electric park to Branchport. So um, here I thought I was like so cool. I put in the first EV chargers at the first winery in the Finger Lakes. And I was literally just barely catching up to my great grandpa from 1897. 
Um, and they had the summer trolleys that looked like this, and then they had the winter ones with little like heating and stuff. It's very cool. So we have a ways to go. We still don't have electric trains. Um, we're starting to get some farm vehicles. This is an electric gator. We all fight over it because it's quiet and you don't breathe in all the fumes from the gas gators. Um, we've got some electric cars. There's still no um, affordable electric tractors or even available electric tractors yet. <clears throat> um, but we're eventually going to get there, I hope. Um, or hydrogen fuel cell tractors. I actually think that would be better because you can fuel them up in six minutes. But they still haven't, they'll, they still haven't like made them available commercially. Um, is anyone focused on waste or recycling? In your studies? Okay, I'll just I'll go quick then. Um, you know, anytime you're manufacturing anything, there's a lot of waste, um, and so we're always looking for ways to tweak and change, and we can recycle the glass, and we can recycle cardboard, and all those things. Um, it dawned on me a number of years ago that the capsules on the bottle, like they're just decorative. It's just a single-use plastic that, like, no one even likes anyway because they slow down your access to your glass of wine at the end of the day. So we got rid of them. And it is literally the only change we've ever made in the business where we didn't get complaints. Turns out everyone hates them. And I actually think it looks better. I think the bottles look more sleek. So um, during the pandemic, we got shut down. New York State made everyone close their doors uh, for months. Uh, so we used the opportunity to put in new flooring. Uh, we worked with a company called Interface. If you guys need a case study to look at a really freaking cool circular economy company, check out Interface. Um, they kind of pioneered um, carpet squares instead of those huge rolls of carpet. So if there's a, a stain in one spot, you just remove the little square and put a new one in. Um, they use biophilic design so that you don't have to waste lots of material trying to line up the design patterns. Like any, any, any square will fit anywhere kind of thing. Very, very cool. Um, and then it, uh, all of their materials are um, made from 100% recycled materials and they're 100% re recyclable at the end of their life. So when this floor is worn out from all the thousands of feet tromping on it every year, we can rip it up and send it back to the company and they put it right back into the materials um, supply chain. And they, they also buy high quality offsets to offset the carbon um, emissions from producing the, the flooring. Super cool company. Um, so job number one is mitigating, like reduce the harm. Number two is adaptation. So, you know, and when I was your student, when I was in college getting my environmental science degree, um, it was like, oh, climate change, it's gonna impact future generations. It's like, well, no, 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 it's, it's impacting us now. <laughs> um, we gotta stop talking about how it's gonna, yes, it's gonna impact future generations and it's impacting us now. Um, so we have to adapt to it. Um, and, and, you know, again, resilience, 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 um, just making our farms and our businesses and our homes as resilient to whatever gets thrown at us is, is super important. So. We've been working on increasing the amount of organic matter in our soils. Organic matter is about 50% carbon. So that when we say we're increasing organic matter, it also means we're increasing the carbon in our soils. When you have higher organic matter soil, it acts much more like a sponge. Um, when we get these huge rainfall events, like the seven inches of rain we got, um, oh, actually the year before, I guess, two years ago, seven inches of rain in one night. And we didn't have any trouble with any of our fields or our vineyards because they acted like a sponge and sucked it up. Um, but our parking lot became a raging river. <laughs> that, was, that was interesting. And then uh, our, the bridge and the gully between the two sides of our farm got washed out. Um, <clears throat> but um, but uh, if you think about at a landscape scale, if every farm were able to put more and more carbon back into their soils and restore other soils, soils then the landscape becomes a sponge and we have a lot less flood damage um, to our infrastructure as a society. So this also helps you know, helps governments reduce costs, et cetera. So um, there's all kinds of interesting work that needs to be done to shift the incentives away from um, focusing farmers on commodity crop, commodity crop production in high yields to um, a whole suite of ecosystem services or, and food production, healthy food production. Um, so we produce compost. Uh, we've done some experimenting with biochar. Um, <clears throat> we grow hay um, and uh, round veil it and then we roll it out between the rows as mulch. It's another way to add organic matter. It helps hold moisture in the soil. In theory, it suppresses weeds, but this is New York, so it doesn't work very well. Um, my brother actually, he used to make us com compost every year with the seeds and the skins that would come out of the presses and get some horses or horse manure and, you know, the clippings and there's always lots of organic waste on a farm. 
Um, and he actually turned it into a business. So he now has a compost business. So he, he makes hundreds of tons of compost every year. We have certified sections of the farm organic. Um, we can talk about that if you guys are interested in certifications. Um, another adaptation we've done is we'll, we'll um, take the hay bales in the fall um, after harvest, we'll drop in the, in the super kind of finicky, delicate uh, Rieslings, the, the European varieties, the Riesling, the Chardonnay, the Cap Franc, we'll drop a wire on every row to the ground and then we'll tie a cane from every vine to the wire and then cover them with hay in the hopes that if we get another polar vortex year or another extreme temperature dro drop that we keep um, the vines above the vine uh, mortality temperature threshold. Um, so that's one of our adaptation strategies. And then in the spring, we rake it all into the middle of the rows um, and it just becomes more organic matter. So you start to understand why, um, <laughs> why it pains us if someone doesn't finish their glass of wine because a huge amount of work goes into making it. Um, sometimes we feel like we're on the cutting edge with some of these, these um, practices and technologies. Sometimes we feel like we're on the bleeding edge. Um, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, I talked to a company I was, I was helping out into giving us one of their prototype vertical axis wind turbines. My dad spent days and days digging trenches and laying cable and installing it in the windiest spot in the farm. And um, it never worked very well. It was a poorly designed, poorly made prototype. Um, but now it is a phenomenal perch for our raptors. And like almost every day you can see a red tail or a peregrine sitting on it. So it's good for rodent control. Um, another important, um, really important thing for me is that, um, you know, you have to walk the walk and, oh, hang on, you've got to, you, you know, you have to, you know, actually you know, do the work in your own life to, you know, try and, and make all these improvements. But then, you know, we're also not islands, right? Like we also have to work with our peers. We have to work with our neighbors. It makes it a lot more fun. It makes it easier because the wisdom of the crowd is always better than um, what, what we know on our own. Um, so I worked with a, and, and helped a bunch of wineries go solar together in 2015. Um, we were able to pressure our member of Congress to cross the aisle and help extend some, some wind and solar tax credits that were gonna expire. Um, so I think you know, there's the nuts and bolts of sustainability, but then there's using your voice as a leader in business to actually do advocacy. Um, and one of the weird and interesting things about moving back home after being a Washington DC policy wonk is that I discovered that I'm actually more effective as a policy advocate with my seventh generation farmer and winery owner hat than I was as just a you know, dime a dozen like DC policy wonk. Um, because politicians really wanna hear from their constituents and they wanna hear from, from people that are providing jobs and tax revenue in their district. So um, any of you that go into business or have family businesses, you know, that's, a, I think, a, a part of our, our social responsibility. Um, I'll run through just a couple more slides and then have your questions ready. We can just chit chat for the next you know, 10, 15 minutes. Um, we finally were able to get a sustainability certification scheme going in New York State. Um, I was uh, quite involved in that. And um, so we're one of the first wineries to get certified. Um, and uh, it involves basically going through spreadsheet after spreadsheet, um, looking at all aspects of the business uh, to see if, you know, how we can improve. Um, have you guys studied the term sustainability in your classes? Anyone? No, yes. It's sort of out of vogue now. Like regenerative is much more in vogue. But when I was in school, you know, it was the classical definition of sustainability was that it was a three-legged stool. You have the environmental piece, environmental sustainability, um, social sustainability, and then the economics, you know, the economics of sustainability. You know, it doesn't matter how environmentally friendly your business is. If it goes out of business, it's no help to anyone. So I think it's a helpful, I think it's a helpful term. It's, you know, any term can be misused, right? Bad actors will misuse whatever term. Uh, it, it, we, we create. I, I have a lot of colleagues who say, oh, I hate sustainability. Um, you know, it's misused and, and I'm gonna talk about regenerative agriculture. It's like, well, that's fine, but bad actors are already misusing that term. So I try to, you know, like they can't have it. They can't take our, our like valuable concepts away from us. So I, I think we should defend, defend the term and, and the beauty of a certification scheme is that it defines it. 
um, so that it avoids the greenwashing. Um, and then you can go through and look at all of the metrics. You can look at the scoring systems and then know that there's a third party independent verifier that comes to, your, to the farm and goes through and verifies that the claims are, are accurate. We're also a member of International Wineries for Climate Action. This is a new organization that was started by a couple of the largest wineries in the world. Um, it's kind of funny, we make you know, 5,000, 10,000 cases a year, depending on when, and these guys make 5 million cases a year. Um, but we're, we're all collaborating to try um, to collectively move the industry um, towards less and less and less climate impact. These are some things that we're kind of in process with on the farm. We've got a project um, where we're adding a whole bunch of um, uh, compost and biochar to some of our hayfields and some of our vineyards. Um, we were inspired by a project they did out in California where they added um, a layer of compost to some, um, some degraded pasture land. And they found that a one-time application of the compost um, caused more, more growth above ground of the uh, pasture grass varieties, which meant deeper roots, which meant more food for the soil microbiome, which meant healthier soil, which meant better growth. So it became this positive feedback loop that lasted for years and years and years. So we designed a project with soil and water um, to see if we could have that impact in our soils, which aren't degraded, but we wanted to see, well, how, how much can we push the envelope? How high can we, can we bring the organic matter levels? So got that ongoing. We're in our third year of that, that project. Um, we inventoried all of our greenhouse gas emissions for the International Wineries for Climate Action. We need to keep doing that. It takes so much time. I don't know when I'm ever going to get back to it. Um, I need students to help. Uh, and then we are creating five acres of pollinator habitat. Um, I think most people think of bees and they think of honeybees, but honeybees are actually native to Europe. They're not actually native to North America. The vast majority of all bees in the world, including North American bees, are solitary ground nesting bees. So they need different habitat than honeybees, not actually social insects. Um, so we're um, turning a five acre field um, out next to, adjacent to our forest into pollinator habitat because a lot of the native bees that we have on our farm need a little bit of both habitats. So um, hopefully by this time next year, you can come and, well, maybe, by fall next year, you'll be able to come and see fields of wildflower um, if you want to hike a little bit. All right. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions if you guys want to dig into any of these issues. And I'm happy to talk about my other job, too, um, where I do public policy related to infrastructure, sustainability, sustainable infrastructure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I don't have a picture of our, I mean, so he asked about automation and harvesting. So we, um, we hand pick some of the grapes and then we also machine pick some of the grapes. That's another benefit of the rugged hybrids is that we can have the machine go over and shake the vines and shake the grapes off and it doesn't, doesn't damage the vines. We would never do that with our vinifera. It also, when you hand pick, you can be more selective than you can with the machine. So that, you know, that helps too if it's a year where you've got some variety and ripeness levels and things like that. Um, but yeah, we do a bit of both. Yeah, so one of the hard things about a permanent crop like vineyards or orchards is that you have a lot less tools in your toolkit to deal with pests than when you're an annual crop grower. So like my friends who do organic grains and vegetables rotate fields they can leave a field fallow, they can do rotational crops, they can do, they can plow, they can do all kinds of things that we can't do in vineyards. So even our organic certified grapes need to be sprayed because there's always gonna be mildew problems, there's always gonna be weed problems. So we're always trying to, to balance, and this is again where I love the term sustainability because continuous improvement is part of, part of the requirement of, of our certification system. Um, so with, the, with whatever spray we're using, and, and some of the sprays we use are called biologicals, where you use an actual like biological um, uh, microbe that, uh, to like we'll spray a microbe on the, the vine that doesn't hurt it, but it thinks it's being attacked and it makes the vine like amp up its immune system to protect itself from mildew. 
so there's some cool stuff like that. There's things like copper you've probably heard of being sprayed, but you, you don't want to put too much because it can, um, you don't want too much of that in your soil. So um, yeah, so we're always balancing what we do, but we have uh, a sprayer. Um, we have a sprayer that goes over the, over the row and recollects any material that didn't stick to the, to the leaves. Um, so it's called a recycling sprayer. <clears throat> Sustainability in terms of water. So this is interesting. This water is one of the biggest issues for some of our colleagues in dry regions like parts of California. Um, because we're blessed with so much water in the Finger Lakes, it's not a resource that, I mean, if anything, like one of our struggles is to put in tilings um, in low wet spots or clay spots to remove too much water because vines, you know, saturated soil is a good way to kill your, your, your vines. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, but then we have years where, and we have neighbors who, who irrigate, who have irrigation um, in their vines for those years where it doesn't rain. I mean, we um, thus far have, not wanted to invest in irrigation. We, in 2016, when we had the drought, we had planted 3,000 baby vines. Um, our older vines have roots that are very deep and, and they do okay in the drought. You know, they, they're gonna have smaller grapes and, and lower yield, but it's it'll beautiful, usually beautiful quality. Um, but the babies really need the water. So my dad luckily is a MacGyver and rigged up, you know, a trailer with tanks and valves and hoses and he, stopped at every vine and, and like watered every single one of them um, during the drought. Um, but yeah, we, we um, it, it, you need to have the right amount at the right time. That's our big challenge. So. We'll go one, two, three, and four. Um, if you take five minutes to get a vine, how long Yeah, and you'll have some grape bunches on the baby vines in the early years, but usually you go through and pick them off and pinch them off um, so that all the energy goes into building the vine up. Um, and you might take a little bit off after a few, you know, it's not like a hard and fast rule. Um, but, um, you know, we have vines on our property that are 120 years old. Um, each trunk might not be that old, but the roots are. Um, and if a trunk gets hit by a tractor or, you know, dies or gets you know, damaged, um, you bring up a, a sucker the next year and, and, and grow a new trunk. So we, that's why we always, if you go look in the vineyards and walk, there's always two trunks so that you've always got um, a backup. Uh, but yeah, grapevines, I was just in Germany a few weeks ago and the Mosul region, and they have vines, vineyards that were planted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago on these crazy steep slopes, which I can imagine if there's marauding bands of like conquerors coming around, you'd want your vines right out your back door so you can work your vines. And, but in, it just looks crazy now, it's just incredible. Uh, but yeah, they can, the, the vines can live for centuries. To what extent is there a vine and other little Um. It's, it's, it's like all society, it's, it's variable. You have some folks that are really passionate about it and, and really engaged and making their own investments and efforts. And, um, and then you have kind of a large group that's not focused on it. So it's variable, which is, which is why a certification scheme is helpful so that you don't have to do your research on you know, every single winery. You can look, and look at the list of certified vineyards and see who is working hard at it. Uh, it's, I'm always um, frustrated that more, more customers don't demand that businesses be more sustainable because, um, or, or, the, or don't come and support those that are, because you know, it doesn't take that much effort, right? Like you can, you can find out pretty quickly who's doing a good job and then go support them and keep them in business. So more homework guys, support the sustainable producers. I'm just curious about the <clears throat> yeah.
titles and there's a commodity title. And it basically provides crop subsidies for a handful of commodity crops, um, grain, corn, soy, wheat. There's some sugar subsidies, there's cotton subsidies. Sometimes there's milk subsidies and that's it. Literally every single other thing that American farmers grow is considered specialty crops. And so it has warped our food system and it's, and it's caused, it's literally shaped the physical and human landscape of America. So this is why I work on policy. Like it's so powerful. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that's, a huge, that's that underlying social issue, I think, in agriculture. So someone up top had a question. I answered already. You know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people think, oh, farmers are conservative and they won't, they, they're slow to make changes, but um, farming is inherently risky. There's so many things that are out of our control. The weather, public safety, the you know, uh, international trade and, and all kinds of things, uh, energy costs, diesel costs, um, labor costs, insurance costs, um, the weather. So, um, you know, farmers are making generally rational decisions based on the incentives in the market, and the incentives are shaped by policy, largely. And, and many, you know, they are in part, in part shaped by policy and market. So um, if we want farmers to make different decisions and more sustainable decisions, we have to shift the policy environment, among other things. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, I went to, and I actually went over because um, I'm trying to get. I, I'm on an advisory board for one of the big agritech companies. I'm trying to get them to shift their business model. Um, but we stay. My husband came. And we stayed for a few days and went to wineries that only. You know, we tried eight different rieslings. Yeah. <laughs> but there's also, um, uh, you know, what like as I was showing the wine map shifting. You know, England is now a major wine, you know, Southern England is now producing wine and, and you know, their version of champagne. Um, uh, yes, so yes, there's actually, I think they may have even allowed a hybrid to be grown because they're very restrictive. The laws in, in Europe are very restrictive. Here, we can plant any variety we want. That is not true in Europe, but they are starting to allow, allow um, some hybrids. In Spain, there's some folks that are working at going and finding wild grape varieties and trying to cross wild grapes um, to get some of that ruggedness and drought resistance. Um, so yeah, there's the whole world is starting to look at this. And it's so interesting because when I was growing up, the hybrid, hybrid grapes was a dirty word because they weren't seen as, as good for, I mean, if I'm honest, I'm always gonna say, yeah, I'm gonna pick a Riesling like every day, but not, but not every day. You know, like the, the, we make a bubbly rosé out of three different hybrids and it's delicious, but it's the perfect wine in the summer. So, and our sherry is made from, from hybrids. So there's all kinds of cool things you can do with them. And I think the world is, re is realizing that. I just, I just um, read a wine enthusiast magazine last night that someone mailed to me. And it was about these hipsters in the Hudson Valley that have discovered hybrids and how you, you can use less spray. And I'm like, oh, what a discovery. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, um, so it's funny how everything kind of comes back around. And like now we're like, yeah, we've been saying this for 50 years. Well, thank you guys. Thanks for coming and taking an hour out of your day. I appreciate it. Thanks for the cookies.